so good to be with you on this wonderful Sunday morning to worship together and to share in God's Word. It's hard to fathom, but I have, Barb and I have been with you for a little over four years. That time has gone by so fast, it's, it, you know, you want to put the brakes on a little bit. But in those four years, there have been probably uh, four or five messages that were of extreme importance. When we looked at Romans 1, when we looked at the definition of grace, when we looked at the whole idea of what you know, salvation is, all these things. Today, we are going to look at something that probably is going to be in the top five, maybe the top three, as far as topic importance is concerned. And uh, it has to do with strongholds and how those affect our lives. So, once again, you know that we uh, video the messages, and I think that for the believers on your friends list, uh, Facebook or YouTube, you need to share this. This is an important topic, something that needs to be uh, put out there. Uh, not because of who's bringing the message, but because of the topic of the message itself. When Paul deals with strongholds, it is for believers. The tools, the weapons, everything that's used in spiritual warfare benefits only believers. Non-believers are already in absolute total bondage and under condemnation, so it, it really doesn't do them any good. They can't access the weapons, the spiritual weapons, to deal with it. So we have to understand from a foundational point that it is for believers that have to deal with this very difficult situation, this very difficult problem. And that is strongholds that are built into our lives. Another thing we need to understand is that strongholds are not built, you know, overnight. They're built brick by brick over time, months and years. And Satan has an opportunity. And one of the great things about being a believer and being filled with the Holy Spirit is that Satan can't get in unless you let him in. All right? You have to give him permission to do these things in your life. And so we're going to be talking about this, dealing with this uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we pray that you might bring to our attention the importance of this message. And that, Father, that through the power of the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we condemn Satan and we ask him in your name and through your power to be gone from this place as we deal with this very subject that he has so much to do with. So, Father, now we just ask your blessing, your anointing by your Holy Spirit. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 And so, second, we're going to two passages that, that we'll focus in on today is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and Ephesians chapter 4. So, you're going to want to uh, be able to, especially be in Ephesians chapter 4, because I won't have all the verses up on, on the slides. But as we begin, uh, probably one of the mo most well known verses to deal with this is here in 2 Corinthians. It says this, for though we walk in the flesh, and here he's talking about the human flesh, not the fallenness of humanity, but the human body. 
We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So these spiritual weapons are used in spiritual warfare to deal with strongholds, with arguments. Now, when he's talking about arguments, he's talking about our defense mechanism that says, I live this way because, or I have this problem because, or this situation because. We put up our own defenses, our own arguments. And so these, these are used against those arguments that we have. Exalted pride. Okay? This is who I am. Take it or leave it. I literally had a guy in a church that I pastored who was just a, a bitter, angry man just all the time. <laughs> you know, I actually got him to smile once and I thought the church wall was going to crack. You know, but he, he, and he just, his excuse was, well, this is who I am. You know? Kind of like what, how we sang this morning, <laughs> who am I, right? Though, this is who I am. An unruly thought life. This is the spiritual battleground. And so Paul says we have weapons to deal with these spiritual areas in our life. Now I've identified six fundamental strongholds which build other levels to fortify their place. They are fear, greed, anger, lust, addiction, and guilt. These are your, your fundamental, you know, your foundational areas of strongholds. And each of these breed other things. So you, most of the time, and I know that, uh, you know, over the 40 plus years in the ministry and the counseling, that I've done, I began to discover uh, in the first few years that in counseling with people that a lot of times you're dealing with the outlying areas and you're able to deal with those and if you don't recognize that it comes from a foundational area, you never get to the root of the problem. And so, they, you know, they, they go, they, they, they find for a little while and then things go bad again and they come back, you know, or they get discouraged or they get despondent or they just leave the church, you know, because they well, I tried, I tried, I tried, and I just can't win. Well, the problem is, I, I know I was counseling this one lady uh, for over a year and we dealt with this problem and this problem and this problem and this problem until we finally got down to the actual real root of her problem and she finally confessed to me a certain thing that happened in her life that, that she did and, and was never able to forgive herself. And once we dealt with that, she was a brand new person. You know, you really need to be able to, to, to work down and find these things. Now, I'm going to give you... Uh, some slides here that help you to, to see this in each one of these foundations and just some of the things. This is not an exhausted list. And I hope that you can, can see uh, these slides. But fear as a foundational uh, stronghold will provide a poor self-image. Now people will come to me and say, you know, and you find, oh, you, your problem is a poor self-image. Well, no, your problem is fear. <laughs> you know, that's the foundation. What do you mean? How does that happen? Well, you fear what other people think about you. You fear what God thinks about you as a believer. You fear every aspect of, you know, how, how am I going to fit into society? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? What if this happens? What if this happens? Oh, this did happen. What am I going to do now? 
And so it, it, it breeds a poor self-image. It breeds anxiety. Right? Can you think of some scripture that has to do with being anxious? Don't be anxious, right? You know, trust in God. There, there's scripture for the doubt. Fear always breeds doubt. You know, Satan will use your fear to breed doubt of whether or not you're really saved. Oh, you're not saved. Look at the way you're living. Look at the things you've done. Goodness, how could God love you? Look at the mess you're in. Look at the mess of your life. How could God use you? What's the stronghold? Fear. And you've got to deal with that. Greed. Greed breeds pride. Thievery. Idolatry. Oh, I don't have any idea. You know, anything that you, is more important to you than God is an idol. Idolatry. Greed does this. Lust. Sexual sins. Filthy language. Pornography. I've had people ask me, you know, well, is there anything in the Bible about swearing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there really is. But, uh, but we need to understand that filthy language comes from a filthy heart. It comes from impurity that's there. And sexual sins, adultery, fornication, homosexuality. We're right in the middle of pride month. <laughs> oh, what a mess. I've told you this before, and I'll tell you this again. There's no such thing as a special group of people called homosexuals. Okay? They used to say, oh, I was born this way. No. There, there, there was a um, thing done by the MIT Science Geolo Geological uh, Society and the Harvard Medical School over several years that proves that that gene that was supposed to be there that made you a homosexual does not exist. It's proven. It does not exist. But they had to come back and say, well, yes, but, you know, you become one because of uh, psychology, sociology, and culture. How you see yourself, how others see you, and how, what others expect of you. That's where all of that comes from. So, there's no such thing. But, we're in the middle of it, aren't we? Anger. Boy, this is, this is one that probably affects more people. You know, anger, it, that breeds bitterness, hate, unforgiveness. These are all things that are conditioned upon anger. It just... Anger is something that, that just churns, all right? It, 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 it's just not dormant. It just churns. And it's just looking for a place to boil over like a volcano. Hate. Bitterness. Boy, we see a lot of bitterness and hate in our world today, don't we? <laughs> now, if you don't agree with a person's lifestyle, you hate if you believe in the Bible, you're a hater. Yeah. You need to let me live the way I want to live. I go, okay, fine. Live the way you want to live. You'll die and go to hell. You know, that's, it's okay. No. no, Jesus loves you. He died for you. Regardless of your life choices, you can come to know him as Savior. Guilt. Woo. Medical and psychological studies have proven that guilt is the leading, one of the leading causes of heart failure. <clears throat> guilt. The inability to deal with our lives. And it breeds lying. It breeds religion. Christians who are filled with guilt usually try to find a legalistic church 
that says you can't do this, you can't do that, and they think that's going to control or deal with their guilt. Depression. Whew. It's a tough one. I don't understand it, but there are a lot of Christians who suffer from depression. There is a biblical method of dealing with depression that I have used, I developed about 20 years ago, I've used it over these years, and for Christians it is 99% effective. It just works. You use scripture to defeat the levels of depression. But you have to get back to the foundation of that, which is guilt. Addiction. Drugs, alcohol, we know that. I put A to Z. <laughs> okay. You can be addicted to almost anything. Social media, video games, you know, all kinds of stuff. Anything that you can't live without. Anything that you can't go a day without participating in, and it just, it's what you think about. It's, so it's the number one important thing in your life that you will give up anything to get. That's an addiction. That's an addiction. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, that we are not to give place to the devil. That's what it says. Neither give place to the devil in verse 27 of chapter 4 of Ephesians. Don't give him a place. And when we give him a place, then he has the legal right to be there and we must employ spiritual weapons to dispel him. Okay? What I find interesting, remember we, we, as we in our series in the book of Galatians, we talked about when Paul said walking in the spirit and what that means. And I find it interesting that, that we can have a heart happy in the promises of God and be plugged into the power of the Spirit. That's really what walking in the Spirit is, being, having a heart happy in the promises of God and being plugged into the power of the Spirit and still have a stronghold that is building and fortifying. They all want to walk in the Spirit. Great! still have fear. You can still have guilt. You can still have a stronghold in these areas. You can even have a stronghold of anger or of lust or of greed. Any of these things, even if you're walking in the Spirit. Let me give you an example about this. To, to, to help us get a better picture of this, let me share with you an illustration that I read from Adrian Rogers. Now, I don't know how many of you know who Adrian Rogers was? He passed away in 2005. He was a pastor and author uh, in, in Tennessee. Uh, and uh, he was born and grew up in Florida. Uh, fine man. And uh, a great speaker. Huge megachurch uh, pastor. But he, he, he gave this uh, illustration. And I read this and it, and it fits uh, very uh, perfectly. Suppose I have 50 acres of land that belongs to me, okay? And you convince me to sell you one acre right in the middle of my... That wouldn't happen, by the way. I'd never give it to you. But, you know, <laughs> suppose you did, and, and I, I would... You know, I gave you that one acre right in the center with the right of way to go to that one acre anytime you want it. And while I'm busy keeping my 49 acres nice and, you know, trim and good looking, and trails and all kinds of stuff, you know, and deer feeders, although that's an illegal, can't do that. And, you know, all these other things that we have there and, uh, you bring in garbage and trash and loud music and you build a, a shack and it's just a, 
an eyesore. It just looks horrible. You know, and and it, it's such a blight on the beauty of the rest of the acreage. And so I, I try to get you to come out, but you don't. You say, this is mine. I have a legal right to be here. Oh, I'm going to get out and get you out. You must leave. No, I'm not going to leave. That's what happens in this. Now, how do I get rid of you? Well, I had to go get a lawyer, and I had to take you to court, and I had to, you know, uh, sue you for uh, violation of the, the property contract and all this other kind of stuff. Um, because in the contract it says you had to keep it up and keep it nice and so on and so forth. And I have to do, use legal means to get you out, to evict you, all right? And that's what you have to do. As you can see, I must use the proper protocols to evict you from my property. In just the same way, we must use spiritual weapons to dispel Satan from the strongholds he legally has a right to reside in. We gave him a place. Let him in. And over time he built a stronghold there. My weapons are spiritual and come from the fruits of the Spirit and the armor of God and are accessed through repentance, prayer, and Scripture. Okay? Now, You'll find a lot of stuff out there, you know, dealing with strongholds, and they'll talk about the armor of God, the spiritual weapons. But sometimes we forget about the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, as a believer, the Holy Spirit resides in us, and He's producing fruit. All right? And I will, again, I'm going to show you some slides uh, that will help you to see what I'm talking about. What about the fruit of self-control. Okay? Can you see how self-control will help you with fear and greed and anger and lust and addiction and guilt? As the Holy Spirit is producing that fruit in me as I access that fruit of self-control. It, it helps me to deal with these things as well as the outline uh, levels that come from that. What about love? You know, Scripture says that perfect love casts out what? Fear. Fear. What is that perfect love? It's agape love that is produced in us by the Holy Spirit. And so it deals with fear and greed and anger and lust and addiction and guilt. I'm not going to do all of the fruits, but goodness the goodness of God, the goodness of the Spirit of God in our lives deals with some of these issues. Kindness is another one that deals with these issues. Kindness is the opposite of fear and greed and anger. So the, the fruit of the Spirit being produced, we access this as part of our weapons. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Paul says this is part of what we do. This is part of our weaponry. This is part of how we deal with the strongholds in our life. Let's jump to Ephesians chapter 6. We all know what's there, right? Armor. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of His might, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in the heavenly places. That's our enemy. That's what we're, we're allowing in. That's what we're giving place to so that they produce fear and greed and 
anger and lust and addiction and guilt. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in that evil day. And having done all to stand, stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Woo! By the way, if you look at this closely, you find that there's not one piece that covers your backside. God does not intend for us to turn tail and run. He says, stand. And having done all to stand, keep standing. Because <laughs> I've given you everything. Everything. Not something. Not part of a thing. Peter says I, that God in, through the Spirit has given us everything that we need to live for God. Everything is another one of those all words with little more letters. Right? All. The most important aspect that there is. Right? So it's, it, it's so important for us to understand that we have this armor. And we have God's truth against Satan's lies. We have this breastplate that guards our heart. We have the helmet of salvation that says, I belong to God. I'm His. I'm saved. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Okay? It's, it's kind of an important aspect, these weapons that are spiritual, but they're there to deal with the spiritual dangers that build strongholds in our life. Well, what is the best definition of a stronghold? Because I don't know if I've got one. Anything that occurs on a regular basis that can at any moment overcome you even when you do not want it to. That will be a signal that there's a stronghold there. That you've let Satan in. You know? You've given him a place. And he's over years he's built brick by brick this fortress and has taken a foothold in your life. It, it, it just kind of, you know, you're going along, you go, I don't want to live that way. I'm living for the Lord. I'm like, Ooh, I can't believe I did that. Oh, wow, I did it again. I've also found that Satan loves to follow a schedule. He will pick a day. And every week, or every couple of weeks, on that day, he will hit you out of this stronghold. Boom! And even when you know it's coming, it overcomes you, it overtakes you. And you go, man, I did not want that to happen. I did not want to do that. I did not want to feel that way. I did not want to be encompassed by depression. I did not want to be encompassed by anxiety. I did not want to, to, to tell that lie. I did not want to... You know, it's, it's all of these things. And it just overtakes your life. Paul discovered this. Paul, the great apostle who wrote most of the New Testament. <laughs> Paul, yeah, listen to what he says in Romans 7. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I invariably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Woo! Man! 
if Paul had to deal with this, I guess just about everybody's going to have to deal with this. You know, when we start measuring ourselves up against that guy. All right, let's turn to Ephesians 4, and that's where we'll finish up this morning. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at several verses that approach this subject and give us a path to follow in dealing with strongholds. Now, we've already looked at verse 27, right, which declares we are not to give Satan a foothold in our life. Now, we're going to look at some of the other verses uh, that, uh, that are there. And I'm going to give you this pattern, right? First, we have to recognize and repent. You, you, you can't repent of something if you don't recognize it's there. So you, a lot of times we have no idea that this stronghold is, is active in our life. We kind of just accept it as, you know, our life, you know, what we experience. But we need to recognize, and then we need to repent. Verses 21 and 22 says this, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, what are we supposed to do? Throw off or repent your old sinful nature, and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Okay? Then you jump down to verses 31 and 32. Get rid of, again, that's recognizing and repenting, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be what? Be what? Kind. kind. Isn't that one of the fruits of the Spirit? Kindness. Be kind to each other. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You have to recognize these outlaying things in your life and then work your way down to discovering what the stronghold is. What's the foundation? Don't just put a band-aid on it and deal with the outlying areas, but work your way down, you know, or, or seek some help in working your way down to finding what that base uh, stronghold is. If you read down, I'm not going to read all the verses that are there, uh, but if you'll read everything from verse 22 on all, all the way down to the end, he deals with a whole bunch of stuff. He talks about... Uh, you know, filthy language, he talks about lying, he talks about stealing, he talks about all kinds of different things that are uh, part of the outlying aspects of, uh, of the foundations of our stronghold. And so we repent. If you do not recognize and repent and surrender to Christ in these areas, you can't do the rest of it. You can't resist. James tells us to resist. Even after you repent, the stronghold is just not going to crumble. After repentance, there must be resistance. To resist, the Greek word to resist means to stand firm and push back. Which is what the whole armor of God is about, right? Standing firm and pushing back. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The place you gave him, you must take back. But you can never take it back until you take away his right to be there. Sometimes, you know, we hear a message about, you know, resisting and we go, oh, okay, okay, okay. I resist you, Satan, you know. And, and Satan just laughs. Because you haven't repented from unconfessed sin. You haven't dealt with the stronghold in your life. And so resistance has nothing whatsoever. It doesn't give you a ground to deal with him. It doesn't legally evict him. Repentance and surrender does that. Okay. Repentance revokes the devil's right to be entrenched in your life. It evicts him from the stronghold, that place you gave him, then resist him using the armor of God provides. 
Just because you kick him out doesn't mean he's not going to try to get back in. Once you've had a stronghold, you ask any person who's dealt with addiction. I have family members who were addicted. And Carolyn says, I've been clean and sober now for how many years? 14. 14 years. But you're always an addict. Period. And there's always the need to resist that. Push it back, push it back, push it back. Why? Because it wants to come back. And there are triggers. Those who deal with addiction don't understand triggers. Things that happen in your life that, oh, I need this, I, I need a fix, I need a drink, I, I need... Depression is another thing. There are triggers, there are things in our life, you know, it's a cycle. Depression is a cycle. You, you go up and then you go down. And then you go up and then you go down. So as we begin to understand this, we need to repent and then resist. About, I don't know, it's been probably 30 years now. Uh, I was part of a conference on spiritual warfare. And we put together this prayer. And over the years I've modified it and so on, but I'm going to share it with you so that you understand how to address the devil in prayer. Okay, because this is really important. You don't just say, Get out of here, leave me alone, I repent, I'm sorry, forgive me. No. There is a special way in which you must address him in order to evict him. You need to have this legal process. Here it is. Satan, I have given you a place, but I take it back in the name and the authority of Jesus by the power of his shed blood. Understand that only those words will evict him. Period. Nothing else. Nothing else. When Jesus was being tempted, what did he do? He quoted scripture and then finally said, get behind me. Only through the authority of Christ and by his shed blood, that power evicts him. Period. Okay? By the power of his shed blood, I repent of and then name the sin. I repent of my anger. I repent of my lust. I repent of my anxiety. I repent. You have no more right to be here. You have no more legal authority. I don't shout at you. I don't plead with you. I don't argue with you. I don't beg you. I bring Jesus Christ against you. You have no authority. This body of mine is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. You are trespassing on my Father's property and in the name of Jesus who I am and whom I serve be gone. Does that work? Yeah. Why? Because it's in the name and the power and the authority and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Satan can not be in that presence. Okay? So, there you go. When the stronghold is destroyed, right, for the tearing down of strongholds, right, you cannot leave that place empty. You need to fill it or renew it. You need to reclaim it for Christ. Paul talks about this in another place where he says that, you know, the demon is cast out and the place is empty and seven more come back in to make it even worse. Man. So you can't do that. You need, to, you need to clean that out. That's kind of important. Clean up the space defiled by Satan. 
Fill that space with God-like behavior. Hmm. Okay. Instead, in verse 23 and 24, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So you've got recognition, repentance, resisting, and then renewing. That's your steps. That just sounds like a lot of work. I'm not sure I want to go through all the trouble of dealing with this. Just remember that we're at fault for giving Satan the ground to build a stronghold in the first place. Right? When we neglect to deal with our strongholds, we cause the Holy Spirit to weep and bring sorrow upon Him. We grieve Him. I think sometimes we forget about that. As believers, the Holy Spirit lives in us. This is the temple of God. This is where the Holy Spirit resides. And not dealing with these things. Really? Really? Yeah. <laughs> Verse 30. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of Redemption. That's what verse 30 says. Don't grieve him. Don't bring sorrow to him. Don't make him weep. Consider that rather important fact. That when we refuse to deal with these things, we bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit and cause him to grieve. Okay. So you carry around inside you the indwelling, powerful Holy Spirit who's grieved, weeping over your unwillingness to recognize and repent and resist and allow Him to renew your life. Paul says to be renewed by the Spirit. He also says not to grieve the Spirit. And in 5.18, he says to be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit means that there's not one room in your temple, why is the temple of the Holy Spirit, where God is shut out, not one closet He doesn't have a key to. In your sex life, your family life, your business life, your political life, your church life, your social life, in your money use, your exercise, your sleep, your eating, as Scripture says, am I lying down, am I waking up? Jesus, I give you the keys to it all. In other words, I surrender all. Father, thank you for our time together in this topic. I pray, Lord, that your spirit might have touched each of us in an area where our need is. And that we might recognize and repent and resist and allow your spirit to renew us. And that we might always be vigilant for Satan's return as he tries to get back in the area that's been reclaimed by your spirit. I pray, Father, that we might employ these weapons that you've given us to deal with our humanity, the fallenness of our humanity. And that we might surrender all to you. Blessed name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people said, mm -hmm. Amen.